a quantitative or in a qualitative way, and we're actually, most of the application of preferences to temporal constraints have been in the case of quantitative, so that's what we're going to consider, okay? But we're going to see also how quantitative preferences have been added in both types of frameworks, qualitative and quantitative. And then we're going to look at uh, uncertainty and we're going to consider the very fundamental notion of controllability, which was applied to temporal networks with uh, uncertainty. And then we're going to mention, talk a little bit about conditional preference, uh, conditional temporal problems where the uncertainty is on which variables actually do belong to my, pro to my problem. And then we're going to mention briefly uh, the combination of preferences and uncertainty. Okay? And uh, what I want to say is that what I'm going to present is a taste of the tip of the iceberg. So there's a very large literature there and I just want to give you an idea, and hopefully from these very general ideas, I won't go into any much de technical details, you can apply them then in your context and in your problems you're working on. So I have to be back to my office on Friday morning, all right, and here are three uh, possible flights. I can go, believe it or not, through New York or Washington or Charlotte, okay? And uh, here I have to leave from Boston at 8.30, and I get New Orleans at 4.30, Boston 6.30, and so on. So these are three uh, flights which have the same cost, so indistinguishable cost-wise. But, and so they would all, they all get me to New Orleans, let's say if I leave on Thursday by Thursday afternoon, so they're all good, right? So how do I distinguish among them? So here I'm leaving at 8.30, getting at New York at 9.45, and then I'm at the airport, or I'm in New York until 3.30. So I might get a little bored, but then, you know, it's New York, so I can go sightseeing. I say sightseeing, but I'm really thinking shopping, so hmm, this might be a good idea, okay? Or I could get up at 6.30 in the morning and go through Washington, but really, at 6.30 in the morning, nobody wants to be around me, so I'm not even going to consider that. And also, there's an hour drive from here to the airport, so this is really a bad option. Here, going through Charlotte, I really have to rush. I have almost less than an hour, all right? So this is the idea. These three options, which satisfy all the hard constraints that Roman would have put on flights, uh, are not equally satisfiable in terms of uh, softer requirements, which are preferences. This is uh, the application of this problem to me flying back to New Orleans, but if, for those of you who attended the Spark workshop uh, yesterday or that will attend the applications um, special track here at ICAPS, they will see that many of the so-called constraints are actually soft constraints and are actually not hard requirements and even those that are stated, for example, when you're on a mission by scientists as hard constraint often have to be softened. Okay, so let's look at preferences in quantitative temporal networks. So we're looking at the Itai Mary, Dactor, and Pearl framework, okay, of simple temporal networks with intervals, and here is how it can uh, actually uh, model uh, uh, part of the mission of the Mars rover on, uh, on Mars. So we have our beginning of the world, or start time. It was midnight for Roman, who had to have breakfast and read his new newspapers. It could be the start of the Martian day on Mars, when the Mars rover has to take pictures. And here you know we have the start of the picture, end of the picture, start of the analysis, end of the analysis. And these are all my intervals containing all the allowed interleaving times between these two time points, right? So in here it means that the end of the analysis has to occur anywhere between 5 and 15 units of time after the start of the analysis, all right? And this is a STP or an STN. P or NP stands for problem, so people coming from the constraint satisfaction community usually use a P for problems. And people, and people more from the planning use N for network, but they're interchangeable. But now maybe we want to put preferences on this, so it's better if the picture is taken as late as possible, so maybe we'll have better illumination, and so we can add these preferences that says, for example, you see here what I'm adding is a preference function over this interval stating that the later is better for the start of uh, taking picture. 
And also I have to take the picture, the picture process, which is not click on Mars, it's all kind of longer <laughs> procedure, has to uh, happen as fast as possible so we don't expose our very expensive camera and so on. All right, and similarly, we can say that the best time for the analysis is around seven and I should take my time to do the analysis so it's more accurate. So what we're doing, and it's better maybe if the two activities don't overlap, so the rover doesn't get too tired, and we're all happy. So what did we do? We took uh, simple temporal networks, okay, and we added a preference function, which does what? It maps uh, every point in the interval to a preference that tells us how much we like that assignment, okay? So where do these preferences come from? These preferences in the, in the original framework came from uh, an algebraic structure which is built to handle the preferences. Basically a set that contains the preferences which is called this carrier. And then we have two operations. One allows you, given two preferences, to understand which one is the best one. And the other one, this times operator here, allows you to combine multiple preferences into one. Right, because in the end you're going to have a solution, you'll get a bunch of preferences from many constraints and you'll want to combine them. So a soft simple temporal network constraint is an interval and a preference function mapping every element in the interval into its preference. And then our nice algebraic structure here gives us a way to reason about these preferences and combine them across the network. So a solution Roman presented different types of questions. When I'm going to have uh, start my breakfast or when, but in general, a solution will be a consistent, an assignment to all the time points, which represent when the start and the end time of our different activities occur, that is consistent with all the constraints, so such that their difference falls in the intervals, right? So when we extend with preferences, Associated to each solution, I'm going to have a bunch of preferences that are going to be associated to the projection of the solutions over all the constraints. And by combining this, by using this combination operator that our C semi ring is uh, supplying, then we can uh, see that each solution will be associated with a global preference. And now solving, okay, can again mean two things. Find uh, an assignment which is consistent and is undominated in terms of the preference, so an optimal assignment, and you can have many. Or find the minimal network such that all its solutions are optimal. Okay, so we're strictly generalizing what Roman said. Nothing more, nothing less. So if we look at our, oh, so first of all, what happens when we add preferences? Can we just add any preferences we want? And just, so, do you remember what, what is the complexity of solving simple temporal networks? Polynomial. So by making this framework more expressive, are we throwing away uh, the advantages in terms of complexity out of the window? Yeah, we are. Okay, <laughs> because you can see that if you allow any types of uh, preferences, then you can uh, reduce, you can map one of the nasty animals that Roman described, TCSPs, which are NP-hard, into, into a problem with preferences, because you basically take a preference function that goes down to zero when something is not contained in the intervals, and then, then back to maximum preference and so on. Right? So given a TCSP, which is NP-hard, you can map it into an STP with a specific up and down preference function, and there goes your tractability. But we still have hope, so of course, uh, in front of NP-hard problems, you can either go two ways, right? You can either go for approximating, which is one possibility. You can do local search, genetic algorithms, and all that. Another is to restrict the problem, and usually you restrict uh, what, uh, in this case, you will restrict what kind of preferences you can have, so what kind of combinations, how you combine the preferences, all right? And also the shape of the preference functions that you want on the intervals. So you saw that going up and down is not a good idea because going up and down on preferences means disjunctions when you kind of think at levels of preferences, okay? And also you want, oops, sorry, this may be surprising that I'm writing this to you, totally ordered means simply that in, in the more general preference framework, you can have uh, incomparable solutions. 
So those, uh, when you add incomparability, then that things get a little bit difficult, so you don't want that, okay? So what are semi-convex preference function? When we cut them at a certain level and we consider the subintervals that are mapped into a preference above that level, we get a single interval. So this, so these are semi-convex, these are not. So these are good guys, these are bad guys, okay? So we are restricting the, the expressivity, if you can see, if you, if you see of, of, of what we can say. So the late, oops. Uh, we can still say the later, the better, the earlier, the better, but we, can, we can't say things like either real early or real late, right? Okay, so fortunately, wow, look at that. Our example for the rover works. All nice semi-convex function, preference functions. And if we look, we could consider a couple of assignments here. We get all the preferences, so here's an assignment with preference 0.6, but we can actually do better than that. We can go up to 0.9, right, by assigning, by starting our picture at 7, ending it at 8, starting our analysis at 9, and ending it at 24 units of time, margin time, okay? So how did I, how did I get this preference? I'm using also a nice... Uh, preference structure, which is called the fuzzy semi-ring, where the global preference on an assignment is the minimum over all the preference it gets on all the constraints, so it's a super cautious approach, right? And the best is the maximum, so we're trying to maximize the worst preference that a solution gets over all the constraints. Hmm? So how can we find an optimal solution? So the two ways in which uh, that Roman described for STPs have both uh, have been ger generalized to work with uh, uh, preferences. One is to generalize path, oops, sorry, path consistency as it is, right? So generalize the notion of intersection and composition. And you remember, what do you do when you do path consistency? You look at all the triangles, you compose the constraints that are on these two edges. So what does composing mean? So I'm gonna take the interval, that contains all the elements, which can be written as a sum of these two. And what do I do with the preference? Well, every time I write one of these elements here as a sum of these two, I'm going to have two preferences. I'm going to take the minimum, and then I'm going to look at all possible pairs that give me this element, and I'm going to take the maximum. Okay? So now I have this, which is a new constraint between xi and xj. So I have two constraints on xi and xj, an old one and a new one, which I obtain by composing these two, and I intersect them. So the intersection of an interval, I'm sure you know what it is. The intersection in terms of uh, preferences means taking the minimum, okay? Taking the strongest requirement, because you're saying this has to hold, hold and also this has to hold, so the most strict requirement has to hold. Okay, so if you do this until quiescence, until some, everything is stable, nothing changes anymore, well, in the end, you might have, in the worst case, you'll be doing n cube, where n is the number of variables. Now, to do this, to do this decomposition here, and to compute the preference for each point, what are we doing? We're discretizing. So on these kind of algorithms, the maximum granularity within an interval matters, okay? And it matters to the cube. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, again, you will have to, in the worst case, every time you're going to lower a preference of one level, so in the worst case, you're going to go down L preference levels. Mm -hmm. So does this help? Or like, you know, with STPs, path consistency was enough. With TCSPs, it didn't really do the trick. So now we're adding preferences, we're putting some restrictions, and yeah, it does help. So after we apply path consistency, what happens is that we're going to have a really nice looking simple temporal network with preferences where all the constraints will have the same maximum preference level. And not only, if I look at the intervals that are mapped okay, into this maximum preference level, they constitute a minimal network. Okay. And all the solutions of these minimal networks are the optimal solutions of the original problem. 
So in polynomial time, you can obtain uh, the minimal network, okay? And then from this minimal network, you can immediately extract in linear time one solution, right? But we will see that actually experimentally you can do a little bit better. So one, those of you who are familiar with fuzzy reasoning say, well, usually when you start uh, working with uh, fuzzy things, one way to go is to perform these alpha cuts, which were kind of the notion that I alluded to when I was doing this uh, defining semi-convexity. And this is a, a second approach. So the idea is of an alpha cut is to cut at a given preference level, identify the subintervals that have a preference greater or equal to that level, and at that point, what do I have when I have just intervals? I have an STP, and I can solve it. And if it's consistent, then I'll be lucky. Here, for example, let's assume it's not consistent, but I can go down and then do the same trick at the lowest preference level and kind of check if the underlying STP structure is consistent. Let's assume it is. And then I can do a binary search over the preference levels and keep doing this trick. And at each step, I cut. I extract the intervals which are mapped at a higher preference and apply one of the solving techniques that Roman has described for STPs. So each step is polynomial. And at some point, I'm going to stop. I decide when. Like in fuzzy preferences, every time I cut, I'm adding one digit. So if you don't want a fuzzy number with a 1,000 digits, you're going to stop maybe after 10 iterations. And you will have stabilized around the STP, which corresponds to the optimal preference level of the network, OK? So a nice uh, way. And look, this really doesn't depend. We're not decomposing the intervals. We don't need to decompose it in many little points. So the R factor here is gone, right? We're only working with the bounds of these intervals. And look at this difference <laughs> in time. This is the path consistency-based method. This is on a, this was when I was uh, doing my PhD, so it's probably, the machine I was working on is probably on a museum now, but still, you can see the dramatic uh, change. So in that case, it really pays off to use exploit alpha cuts. Now, in general, you may not be able to do the trick unless you're using fuzzy preferences. So what is one bad thing about fuzzy preferences? Does anybody know? So the point is that you're telling me the preference of my solution is the worst thing that happens, right? The worst thing it gets across all the constraints. And this is called the drowning effect. So no matter how good somebody is, the preference is drowned into the worst thing, right? And this may not be desirable. It may be desirable like in critical situation where you really want to maximize that worst thing. If it's critical, if it's death or life, then you really want to maximize it. But if you're not in a critical situation, then if you have two solutions, OK, S and S prime, that get, say, preference 0.2, 0.3, and 0.2, these are the three preferences that this solution S gets on three constraints. And then you have an S prime that gets these preferences. For fuzzy, these two S and S prime are undistinguishable, right? They're both 0.2 good. But you can see that S prime is pretty, is better. Now, you can refine the alpha cut procedure in order to find a so-called Pareto optimal solution. Where by Pareto optimal, we mean an assignment such that it will never be dominated on all the constraints by uh, one assignment. So there's no other assignment such that on each constraint, it's going to get a higher or equal preference, higher and strictly, strictly higher on at least one constraint and equal everywhere else. So how do we do this? Just briefly, we don't have time to go into detail. We do the alpha cut. At the alpha cut, we will have one or more constraints that are actually the culprits of drowning the solution to a given preference level. We push all these constraints up and make them irrelevant. And then we keep solving for the rest of the problem. Okay? And that way, one by one, we can do away with these drowning constraints and uh, focus on optimizing on the rest. Little more expensive, but finds a nice pretty optimal solution. Okay, so um, 
uh, Roman described disjunctive temporal problems with the uh, preferences. Do you remember what DTPs are? So we said STP, one interval, two variables in the constraint. TCPs, two variables, multiple intervals, right, in the disjunctions. DTP is a big mess. Multiple variables, multiple intervals, right? And of course, one natural idea is that on each of these intervals, I can add a preference function, telling you how much I like for each interval, the assignment there. Hmm. Now here, it's no, no longer uh, a matter of finding a tractable solution. Why? Because DTPs are non-tractable. We are generalizing them, so there will be, there's no hope to be tractable. So, and what did it mean to solve a DTP? Do you remember what Roman said? It means basically to find a component STP that is obtained by selecting one disjunct per disjunctive constraint that is consistent. And that's the trick that Pollock and Paintner proposed. So you start from the lowest preference level, you cut the DTP, okay? You cut the preference functions, you obtain certain intervals, and then you look for a consistent STP, and then you move one level up, okay? And the way you move one level up is by exploiting, you try first, so to speak, the consistent STP you found at a lower, low, at a lower level, okay? And uh, the good news is that, again, you are increasing the complexity of the underlying hard constraint problem, DTP, of what? Of a polynomial factor linearly in the number of different preferences that you allow and an n to the cube for the variables, okay? So some of you just may look horrible, but it's really not that bad in practice. Now, one way to solve the, one way to um, uh, solve the drowning effect of uh, fuzzy preferences was to say, okay, we're going to look for a Pareto optimal solution. Another is to say we're going to use completely different preferences, maybe more natural, that say where, when I associate a level, it means how much, what is my utility of getting that? And I want to combine them by taking the sum, and I want to maximize the sum, okay? So this framework doesn't, you can't map this into a semi-ring structure because the combination operator is not intensive, but this is a detail that doesn't really matter. So you have to develop ad hoc algorithms. You can't really exploit what was done for the general uh, C-semmering uh, preference structure, okay? So one idea is, again, if you allow any types of preferences, you're again falling into disjunctions. And uh, so you're basically looking for a consistent component STP like you're doing in DTPs, right? And you can actually have a greedy incomplete algorithm that was basically trying to uh, improve by replacing the STP constraints found at one level, pushing them up because you're increasing the utility, so it will only do better. Then you can put some nice ribbons on this greedy algorithm like pruning, or like a divide and conquer um, strategy and make it complete, okay? A nice uh, complete algorithm with ribbons, but still pretty slow, all right? But other approaches have been actually a little more successful, such as that to reducing it to a SAP problem, okay? Or weighted constraint satisfaction, which basically moves the preferences from the intervals to priorities on constraints, and can then can be dealt in a so again, this is, a, this is a taste. So what you should remember here is that preferences can be fuzzy, maximize the minimum, or utilities, maximize the sum, all right? And depending on which way you go, you're gonna have to deal with different types of problems, okay? Just uh, one slide on qualitative networks. They have been extended in parallel, actually, to the quantitative, um, uh, frameworks, so we're extending Allen's algebra and uh, the point algebra. So here's an example of Allen's algebra, so what Giacom Badaloni and Giacomini and others proposed was to basically label each uh, relation with uh, a preference level, and they fuzzified actually the algebra, so these were again fuzzy preference le uh, levels. 
I don't know why this guy disappeared. So in that way, you can extend the interval algebra, the point algebra. SA was this uh, subset, tractable subset of the interval algebra that um, uh, Roman alluded to at the end. This is an even nicer SA continuous, using, allows for even, for just uh, path consistency to work on it, same here. Okay, so you can extend everything which has been done without preferences, you can extend it to fuzzy preferences. And the nice thing is that all the operations still work. You can, you can extend intersection, composition, and everything still works. And you can also combine quantitative and qualitative fuzzy problems. So if you want to look more into this, um, I encourage you to look at the work by these authors. Okay. One uh, thing on the side is, so you may wonder, when I put these preference functions, and if you are working into applications, you're going to say, but where am I going to find all these preferences? I need an expert that sits there, looks at 300 intervals, and draws a, a preference function over all of them. Sometimes, maybe, okay. Other times, they're going to, you know, especially if scientists that don't really understand what you're doing or what your framework is, they're going to go, 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 get lost. So, the idea is that maybe instead we will have some way to rate global solutions. So maybe there's an expert like Mark Giuliano last yesterday on telescopes and I will show him a complete schedule for the Hubble telescope and he will be able to tell me, hey, this looks pretty good. This looks like something that will work. Okay? So the idea is can we learn, can we induce from ratings of complete solutions, preference function, local preference functions, such that when I have done this and I solve uh, my STP with preferences, I'm going to obtain the same behavior that is uh, uh, expressed in the, in the global preference function. So you can do this, and uh, it, I'm sure there are many of you who are familiar with machine learning. So the task in machine learning, you have a bunch of examples, and you want to formulate an hypothesis that approximates this target function. Okay, by means of an error. What does it mean in our case? In our case, the solutions were complete schedules with a preference rating attached to it. Okay? And then we said, okay, let's, uh, we need some parameters on which to learn. And what we did is, okay, let's assume that our preference functions are all parabolas because we want semi-convex animals and so on, right? And then we had the sum of square errors on how well we were doing compared to what was actually rated by the expert expressed in terms of these parameters on the parabolas, okay? And the learning technique was just a plain gradient descent. So in our learning module, we were giving the module the underlying hard constraint structure, the STP. Then we were giving it a bunch of solutions with a preference function, and the output was uh, an STPP. Then this STPP was uh, taken and could be solved and the more optimal solution further inference could be made than what we, because in general each eliciting each of these uh, would be um, expensive. Okay? So for example, if I, just, just to give you an example, we generated a problem, a toy problem of eight activities to be scheduled in 24 hours and the global criteria was uh, um, maximum lateness. So you were trying to, the solution that would end up, a schedule that would end the earliest would be the best. So we generated all 900 solutions and rated them so we had 37 optimal solutions. We trained it on 200 solutions and these are the absolute mean error, maximum absolute error that we got. We're using fuzzy preferences, okay? So this means with two digits of a precision, so we're 1%, 4% error. And we actually detected 29 unseen optimal solutions. There was a little bit of flattening, but it was a nice compact way to represent preferences and to extract uh, local preferences on which we can then reason from global ones that are much cheaper, easier, faster to elicit. Okay, so are there any questions on preferences before I move to uncertainty? Yeah. Summarize the preferences on from like, like the the local preferences into a preference over the entire network, 
and it seemed to be normalized at one. This, um, this one? No, this was se several slides. Ah, up. okay, wait. wait. Um, uh, normalize, we don't do ever any, it might have been, stop me when, I think, are you meaning the one where the minimal now? <laughs> almost there. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah. This one, Yes. right. So this is, uh, this is an example which I picked uh, because uh, in general, I mean here, this was the input network, okay? And uh, the maximum preferences here were all at one. In general, this is, does not have to hold. So when you do the trick of applying path consistency, if you, if you have different maximums preference on different constraints, what you're going to end up is uh, the same maximum on all the constraints without normalization, just through path consistency, which is going to be lower or equal than the minimum maximum over all the constraints at the start time. Okay. Sorry, why, why, is it, why is it the same maximum? Uh, because uh, if, uh, if it wasn't true, then uh, path consistency would not be stable. So you can prove that at quiescence, when everything stabilizes, there cannot be any constraint with a different maximum. Otherwise, path consistency would propagate and bring down also the other maximums. So that's, uh, that's the trick. Okay, I hope that sure. answers. Other questions? Um, you, you were describing earlier uh, the method you were using to get Pareto optimal solutions. Yes, yes. The way you described that made it sound a lot more like a lexicographic objective than... Um, yes, in fact, uh, you, you're right. We don't okay. get any Pareto optimal solution. That's not a guarantee. Right. So right. you're right, the Pareto optimal solution will definitely depend on the order in which uh, I choose to push up and make uh, the, the weakest links, these uh, drowning links, uh, irrelevant. Right. So it's not guaranteed to find any optimal solutions, nor a compact representation of, of all the Pareto optimal solutions, but just one. Okay. Uh, and the other question, you sort of looked like you were um, kind of jumping through a lot of hoops to get, so that you could turn a global uh, objective into these local ones. Yes. It looks to me like this would be relatively easily solved by a CP kind of solver. What advantage do you get sort of relative to just formulating this in CP and throwing, because it's still an NP hard problem. You're talking about the machine learning approach? No, no, sorry, sorry. Bef so you convert, you use machine learning so you could convert it into this special form. But why couldn't you have just taken the original problem with an original objective, which was make span? Oh, uh, oh, yeah, and yeah. Pl just plug that and just plug then. Yes, yes. So what, yes. What advantage because do you because the problem is that that was a, like actually a silly example with maximum lateness, which could be coded. But maybe the the preference function is that of this uh, superhuman expert, which looks at the schedule and doesn't is not able to uh, write uh, uh, analytical formulation of his preference function. So you want to do that whenever you don't know the preference function. So you're right, that, that example was kind of misleading. It was just a toy example to show how it worked. But in general, you want to do it when you don't have any representation, nice representation of the target preference function, the global one that you want. Or maybe it comes from different experts and you don't know how to merge them. That's why, that's when machine learning works. And in that case, the local representation of preferences would be the way, the analytical way to represent this unknown function. And, and so once you've got that local representation, however you yes. get, how much of an advantage do you get of putting it into these sort of specialized algorithms as opposed to something like a general CP solver? Well, I don't know what you mean. Uh, uh, because what we have is a CP based is a CP based optimizer that works on this type of temporal okay, so constraints. So okay, it's just a specialized. CP yes, so. yes. So I wouldn't imagine so the generic ones uh, would do any better. Let's put it this way: it is a CP approach. It's a branch and bound, if you want. Well, it's either the decomposational, or you can see it also as a branch and bound deviation on temporal constraints. Okay. Okay. So maybe we can, yes, yes. Uh, another question about um, learning these um, preferences. Uh, do you think it's possible to um, have experts um, define more specifically what they want? Like if they say, 
I don't like this solution because this and this is wrong or because this shouldn't be here or something like that. Right, so you're talking about explanations. And there are actually CP techniques that incorporate explanations and that map explanation into constraints, like negations, there are no goods, the so-called local no goods when you do it during search. Actually, this has not been explored to the best of my knowledge in, in the temporal field, but it's it certainly is interesting to be able to encode the rating plus the explanation as a, a further constraint. That would speed up and put further requirements on the networks, basically, right? So it's, it's definitely interesting. Okay, so maybe we can move on to, to uncertainty and... and um, all right, so now I have to <laughs> go. Maybe I should just go with the... Now you're going to get Kyle. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully this will still work. Okay, so now we're going to consider an extension that uh, considers uncertainty, okay? So the idea is, and we're going to take STPs, again, and extend them with uncertainty. How? What is the type of uncertainty we want to model? It's uh, on the occurrence of uh, certain time points. Okay, so let's look at this example. Here we have uh, some variables which we call executable variables, such that I decide at what time these things occur. The start of when I start my experiment, when I start aiming my satellite, when I end aiming a satellite. I have the joystick that decides it and I decide. Then there are other variables that you want to map into your problem that are controlled by exogenous agents or by nature or whatever you want to call these that you can't control. For example, the end of the cloud coverage, right? Okay, but still you're going to have to deal in many practical applications with these uh, kind of uncontrollable events, okay? And you will be able to set out either intervals in which you will know that they will occur Okay, or windows in which you're, there, you're actually restricting the window in which you're interested if they occur or not, right? So I'm going to observe this area and I'm interested and the clouds can end anytime between one and eight on this area and I want to start aiming um, uh, when the, around when the cloud coverage ends, otherwise it's not gonna be worth uh, using the battery. Okay, so, uh, what happens to consistency? Now I have some variables that I can control and others that I can't control. Does it make sense to say I'm going to look for an assignment that is consistent with all the, the constraints? No, because I can't decide some of the assignments. So the consistency is mapped into controllability. And you can be more or less demanding in terms of controllability. So controllability will be, we'll talk about uh, properties of the assignment to only controllable variables. And in strong controllability, you require that there exists a way to assign the variables that I control, such that whatever happens, whatever is the assignment of the uncontrollable variables, my solution will always work. Very strong requirement. So a priori, I look at the uncertainty. Ooh, oh, are you okay? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wow, oh, my talk is really strong. <laughs> People are dropping that. So, so, um, so there's an assignment that works for all the possible scenarios in the future, okay? Dynamic controllability says, okay, let's start playing the game. I execute, nature executes, okay? And based on what happens in the past, I'm always able to decide whether to execute or not. Uh, uh, um, event which is under my control, okay, without ever having to backtrack. So, but just looking at what happened in the past, I'm able to make a good decision that will hold for whatever nature decides in the future. And weak controllability means, assume we have an oracle that comes down and says, hello, the, the uncertain future will actually happen to be this. Can we may be sure that whatever the oracle says, I will have a solution? Possibly a different one, not a, the same one for all the situations. And this is weak controllability. Okay? So these are the, the intuitive okay, um, ways of defining uh, controllability. Now, 
There is also a more uh, a definition which is more tied to the framework, which is called pseudo-controllable. Pseudo-controllability means take your STPU, forget that some of the variables you can't control, run some consistency algorithm that Roman presented, and then go look at the intervals on the contingent constra constraints and see if any of those uh, shrunk. If they did, it means that some assignment to the uncontrollable variables you can't control, and that's it. Okay, so this is, doesn't make much uh, sense. I mean, it, it's an it's a, it's a operational definition. But usually, what is easy to say is that if I'm not pseudo-controllable, I'm not weakly controllable, and thus I'm not dynamically controllable, and so I'm not strongly controllable. So in polynomial time, because pseudo-controllability means running a pa uh, one uh, consistency check on an STP, I can rule out if this problem is not worth any further consideration. Okay, let's go here in the example. So pink is uncontrollable, blue is uh, controllable, okay? And uh, in, in the literature, what you do, you can see that if I fix a duration on all the contingent constraints, this one and this one, then I obtain an STP, okay? Because the uncertainty is gone. I'm making a strict uh, tight assumption on the uncertainty. Okay, and these uh, STPs here are called the projections of the original STPU, okay? And one thing that always usually people miss is that any possible combination on the contingent constraints must be considered, okay? Any possible combination. So you have to be able to pick the durations on the contingent constraints in any possible way, and that will give you a projection. Okay, so there's no consistency relation on the, everything is totally possible on the contingent side of the world. Hmm? Okay, checking strong, strong controllability. How do we do this? I have to speed up a little bit, so let's look at the example. Here we have a problem, again, our controllable part, then we have these uh, uncontrollable variables here. So the idea behind strong controllability is that you can translate the strong controllability requirement into a new constraint only on executable variables, okay? So it means that in order for A assignments to A and B to be consistent to whatever happens to C1 given these constraints, okay, I can shrink this interval and leave only the values that will actually be compatible with this, okay? And you can do it for one variable or you can do it with two variables. But what you need to understand is that you just look at all these triangles or squares that involve uh, contingent constraints and you're able to obtain new constraints only on the executable part. And then you can throw away all the contingent part, which means all the variables and the constraints that touch them. And then what are you left with? An STP. And now you can check if these further restrictions you have made to the executable, to the requirement constraints, due to the fact that you want to strongly controllable all, control all these parts, are compatible with each other. And how do you do this? You run an STP check on this uh, simple temporal network. Okay? Polynomial. Strong requirement. Usually the stronger thing you require you require so much that it come, kind of becomes easy to see whether it holds or not. Weak controllability is the opposite way. Very weak requirement. For any possible scenario, situation, is there a way I can figure out how to execute the things that are under my control? So this in general is a co-MP complete problem. Okay, whoops, sorry. And actually, you don't need to um, look at the, all the intervals, but you only need to look at all the bounds, okay, look at all the possible combinations of the upper and lower bounds on the contingent constraints and then run a consistency check. It's not as a brutal exponential as if you had to look at all possible duration, but it's still not a pleasant creature, okay? And usually this weak controllability means uh, it's such a weak requirement that is not really interesting in practice. I want to mention really uh, quickly, I, I think I'm going to have to fly over this, but there is a recent approach uh, that converts controllability strong and weak into satisfiability mo modulo theory. 
which is a fragment of the first order logic where the interpretations are constrained to satisfy a specific theory. For example, linear re uh, real arithmetic. Okay, so basically what they do here, okay, for consistency, for strong controllability and for weak controllability, they translate these requirements into SAT formula in a specific satisfiability modulo theory, for example, linear, so for example, our time points become real variables, okay? And then you can see that this is just consistency. You want the conjunctions of all constraints, which are disjunctions of uh, STP constraints, right? The difference has to be bigger than the lower bound and smaller than the upper bound, and you just get a type, a specific type of SAT formula in this case, non-quantified, but when you move to controllability, it's actually going to be quantified. And you have to do it in a smart way so that these uh, solvers, which have been develop developed for SMT, for satisfiability model modulo theory, can, um, can um, aggressively solve and, and uh, this problem in a, in a fast way. And uh, these uh, approaches have been shown, once you get the right encoding, so the right way to translate your controllability requirement into a satisfiability formula, then the trick works, because these uh, SAT solver are highly tweaked, and they'll give you an answer very, very quickly. Okay, so I don't have time, but look at this line of work. It's by Cimatti and Micheli and others. And it, it looks certainly like a nice, uh, promising um, uh, application. Am I eating? I'm getting <laughs> some of your time, I think, right? OK, so I want to talk about dynamic controllability, which is kind of the most uh, uh, interesting application in practice. And the idea, as I said, is to be able to execute what is under my control based on what happened in the past without ever having regrets, right? Without ever having to backtrack. And the way this is solved, and uh, in the first paper by Vidal and Farger, it was anticipated that it was going to be an ugly type of creature, a difficult type of problem. But then surprisingly in 2001 and Ichikai, it was discovered that it wasn't. And the way this was done was through two ideas. One are, are these ternary constraints, which are called weights, like as in waiting, one point has to wait for another, okay? And the other was how to regress these weights uh, across the network. So let me give you the fundamental concept of a weight, okay? So this is something that is really elegant and was the breakthrough to bringing this problem, which is really important, elegant, and useful in practice, down to the polynomial cage, okay? So here you have two controllable events, A and C, and one uncontrollable, B, okay? So a weight will say that C has to wait for B, for the contingent event to occur, until two units of time elapse after A has occurred, and then it can be executed safely. Let's look at it in this example. Why is this the case? Why is this true? So if I execute C, well, whenever, first of all, whenever B, you can see from this interval, we have a negative lower bound and a positive upper, down, upper bound, so B and C can be ordered in any way, right? Then I can see that whenever B executes, if I uh, am under the assumption that I can instantaneously fire C, then I will have B minus C equals zero and I'm fine, okay? So whenever B fires, I can immediately fire C, or I can even do it after one unit of time, actually, and I'll be fine, okay? Now, if uh, I fire B at 1, let's assume A is 0. If I fire C, sorry, at 1, and uh, whoever is controlling B um, plays against me and fires it at 3, then I'm... Uh, that, that will not satisfy this constraint, right? However, if I wait until 2, and B has still not been executed, and I, and I fire C at 2, no matter when B execute at 2 or 3, then I'll be fine, okay? So this was the fundamental concept. This and the way we can say, okay, well, if C has to wait for B, for two units of time after A, and C is connected by some constraint to D, then also D will have to wait for B, and so on. 
So the understanding the concept of weight and how you can regress weights through these networks was uh, the original breakthrough that started the whole uh, dynamic controllability saga, as I call it, which started with this original paper which I just described, which was uh, n cube to the r. So this was called a pseudo-polynomial algorithm because this r was, again, the maximum granularity of the interval. And though, so the purists of complexity were kind of frowning and saying, well, this is only a pseudo-polynomial. Uh, it was like such a great result. I was like, why are you complaining? So then they worked on it, and they refined it. In 2005, we had an n to the 5, OK, by moving basically the whole computation to the distance graph that Roman described, OK? And then remove, changing pseudo-controllability to the consistency of a specific projection, and then using instead of an all-pair shortest path, a single source shortest path, a Bellman-Ford, which has a cutoff, right? You know, Bellman-Ford only runs for as many times as the nodes are, and that gives you a cutoff to the complexity and does the trick and does away with this pseudo-polynomial problem. Then Paul Morris improved it to n to the 4 again in 2006. Hunsberger n to the 4 incremental version. And a month ago, we reached the, the bottom, right? Because uh, Morris, Paul proved that CPA IOR in a CPA IOR paper that it's an n to the cube algorithm, okay? And you can see why this is the bottom. Why? Because we're not going to go under consistency, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, if we, if we don't have any contingent events, we're at, we have an STP. And to solve an STP, then we have to spend n to the cube. So that's kind of the end of the story. But if you want to, there's an n to the cube. Sorry. Well, that would have been amazing. So I forgot to <laughs> put this at the exponent. But there is an n to the cube incremental algorithm presented at this, algor at this conference. And I think there is another interesting paper that I might have missed. Uh, uh, also at this uh, conference, okay? Okay. All right, so I think uh, I have to stop here. Yeah, yeah, they, I, they, yeah, yeah, we should talk about uh, applications. Uh, this is just combining uncertainty with uh, preferences. So you're going to have uh, strong controllability, dynamic controllability, and weak controllability with the additional requirement of being optimal. And the trick is always the same. Alpha cut, apply now the controllability algorithms, and then merge the results you get at different levels in a smart way. I wanted to just mention contingent. I'm sorry for this. I always put too many sides. Contingent CTPs so that we get the connection with temporal networks uh, with alternatives. So let's assume we want to go skiing. It's a little hot now, I think, but maybe. I think there is good skiing around here at some point in time, right, in the, in the, during the year. So we're going to leave from home, drive to Dubya. In Dubya, we're going to see if this road is viable to Ski Resort 1, okay, or if we'll have to go to Ski Resort 2. In Ski Resort 1, we're going to want to get there before 11 because it gets really crowded. In Ski Resort 2, they give us a discount after 1 p.m., so we're cheap and we want to get there after the discount, okay? Sorry, this is that. So here is a conditional temporal network. So what is the idea of the conditional temporal network? That the uncertainty now, like in temporal networks for it with, with alternatives, is on what is going to be part of my problem, OK? So here you can see that, and the way this is done is by associating or labeling with some temporal, some, uh, uh, temporal variables with labels, which are propositions, logical propositions, OK? And uh, these uh, uh, temporal uh, events will be part of my problem only if their labels are true. And then for each of these labels, I will have uh, some uh, temporal variables where the truth of these labels will be revealed to me. Okay, so I'm going to start my trip to Dubya, okay, from uh, zero plus infinity at some point I'll go skiing, okay. Then it will take me two hours to go from home to W, and when I get to W, 
The truth the value of this proposition, road to ski resort one is vi vi uh, viable, will become evident. I will see either road closed or road open. And then uh, I will decide on where to go. Okay? So you can see that the, the difference is on uh, the branching is translated into propositions. And I'm just going to conclude by saying that we have softened this by allowing people to consider different values of truth. So instead of true or false, something can be true at different levels. So depending on my car and how risky I am, even if the road is closed, I may move the barrier like they do in Italy and just go if, wherever you want to go. And then if you get stuck, you have to call the helicopter, blah, blah. OK. Or, and, and also, you can condition the preference function. You can see you can put preference function over these intervals here, right? And you can condition the preference function on the truth values of the labels. So you can get super sophisticated. So two things that I want to just uh, point out. In terms of preferences, the key idea is try to decompose the, the problem with preferences into a set of problems without preferences and then merge the results together, okay? And uh, in terms of uncertainty, I think what played a key role was on which form of the network to work on, either the actual one with the intervals or the distance graph. They're equivalent. But sometimes if you put the things in a right, with the right makeup on, then you can really see the features that will make you get your great result, okay? And now the fun part on applications. If uh, you have any questions, maybe there's not time right now. I'll be around after the, the, for lunch, so if you want to ask me. Okay, so I'll pass on to Robert.